Okay, we'd like to wish everyone a good morning. This is being recorded for Sunday morning, the 10th of October, as we're currently, hopefully, in Greenville, South Carolina, Lord willing, and attending church service ourselves. So please do pray for us as we go about looking for college for Phoebe and a church over there. So appreciate your patience with us and allowing us to do that. So again, this is for the 10th of October. This will be part 60 out of the series, Giving Thanks Always. And just by way of announcements, as of right now, we'll keep wearing masks and services. I don't have to for this broadcast because no one's here, of course, but we'll keep wearing masks until we see a certain decrease in COVID, which it's heading there. And maybe by the time we come back, we won't need it, but we will see. And do please pray for us with the siding that we're hoping to get done and with the trip as we hope to come back on Thursday the 14th. So we do, again, appreciate you praying for us and we're praying for you. By way of prayer requests, please keep praying for my mother and my father as she had surgery, she's recovering, doing well. And my dad's working on the estate of my grandparents Pray for Miss Susan as she's traveling also this week. So she appreciates those prayers and pray for Matthew as he's in college. And Phoebe, she's going to be starting her college class up, I believe the Friday after we come back. So please keep that in your prayers too. Pray for Brother Fred Carroll with his potassium levels. Pray for Miss Midge, if you would, with her broken hip. Let's go ahead and we'll pray for these things. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would help each and every person that's watching this broadcast, that it would be an encouragement in some way. We pray that you would work on hearts and lives as we consider the study to do your word. Please fill us with your spirit, and we'll thank you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So looking at Ephesians chapter 5 again, and verse number 20, Ephesians 5, 20, says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember our outline, are you thankful that you're God's child? Are you thankful that he sent his son to die for you? That's, that's the foundation of our faith. That is all that everything we have, everything we believe settles upon. Without Christ, we have nothing. Everything we promote in the church is to be Christ because without Christ, we have nothing. Are you thankful that God sent his son to die for you, for your sins. And so you could be redeemed. Christ was raised from the dead, proving that we could indeed have the same one day, as 1 Corinthians 15 says. And just so are you thankful for the word of God. Do you study it? Have you studied it since we last met? What did God speak to you about in it? Are you thankful for it? Is it your necessary daily food? It must be if we're to follow Christ. If we're to say we love him, we must love his word. And are you thankful for God's spirit that he gave in a unique way to help us during this age? So going back to Galatians chapter 5 and looking at verse number 16 the Bible says again, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions. And we've been in the midst of this brief recap. I know brief means few weeks, but remember this whole thing took us months to cover. And so I just want to get it back in your mind as uh, me especially, we're so prone to forget, but we're in the midst of this, this uh, concept of hatred and looking at the topic of strife especially. If there's one thing that churches have a problem with, it is anger. People leave churches, churches split, people are consumed, devoured by the devil because they refuse to put their anger in check. Now all of that's birthed through pride, of course, but strife, I mean, you have churches fighting one with another, factions within any given church. Why? Why? And there's really no, no purpose to it that would help our, our Christian walks. It's just of the flesh, isn't it? Just of the flesh. One person or both, they get full of themselves, refuse to humble themselves before each other in God's word, and thus you have what you have today. Strife is, by definition, electioneering, intriguing for office, having a desire to put oneself forward, thus creating a factious spirit, creating factions, causing splits, etc. And so we started looking at this just on Wednesday, and we looked again at the example of Korah, how Korah is just that example of those insane, absolutely insane people as we covered that gather other crazy people with them to oppose all that's good and godly. Korah, the man who had compared with the rest of the congregation of Israel, had a great privilege, but it wasn't enough. And so he went to usurp Moses, went and tried to perform a coup, if you will, but Moses, being God's man in deed, not just in word, he humbled himself as he did most of the time. And God showed these people who, was, who were his. So we consider Korah, I'll not go back over it. You can look at the previous messages on it, but it's so important that we understand we're going to look at Absalom again, and Absalom's a picture of a bitter person that causes division instead of working things out, being reconciled. And that's another thing we fall into in our society and in the churches. People get bitter. People get what we call you know, burrs in their saddles against others. They start to nitpick. They feel that they've been wronged for some reason, and instead of working things out and even attempting to work things out, they just get mad, and they leave, they disappear without a trace. Very terrible things tend to happen. I've seen it, not just in my 10 years as a pastor, but my whole life, as I've seen in the various churches I've been in, Battlefield Bible Church, and Victory Baptist Church, and Temple Baptist Church, and Emmanuel Baptist Church, and so on. Harvest, or not Harvest, Heritage, and uh, Calvary, and even here, I've seen it. People get angry, they get bitter, they do not deal with their anger, they'd rather gossip around the community about people and churches, they'd rather hold anger, grudges, bitterness against people in the church, they would rather disappear instead of working things out. And Matthew 18 commands us as believers to work things out. Other parts of scripture, Matthew 5 commands us to work things out. Out, 
but you and I both know people don't do that today. Absalom was one who was failed. He was failed by his father. And David was wrong, but it didn't excuse Absalom's actions. That we are failed does not excuse our sin. That people do wrong to us does not mean we can do wrong back to them. Not rendering evil for evil, as the scripture says. There is no excuse for our sinful actions. So let's look at Absalom. Well, one, we have to look at the context and ask the question, well, who was Absalom? The answer to that you find in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 1. 2 Samuel 3 and verse number 1, you find the lineage of David's children. That's rather interesting putting that in context of all this. But the Bible says, Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and his second, Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and it goes on from there. So Absalom would be David's third-born son, David's third-born son. He had two wives, Abigail and Ahinoam, according to 1 Samuel 25, but he apparently took more to himself during his time reigning in Hebron, and it was through these children that he would have the most trouble. So Absalom, David's third-born son. What happened to Absalom? And it's not so much what happened to Absalom, but what happened to his sister, Tamar. His sister Tamar was taken advantage of, we would say, because it literally is so, she was raped by her own half-brother, Amnon, David's firstborn. We see all this given to us in 2 Samuel 13, verse 1 through 22. Just to summarize for you, we have that Amnon, David's firstborn again, fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. It says, 2 Samuel 13, verse number 1. It came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. So you have Amnon, and then you have Amnon's cousin, whose name was Jonadab. He was very subtle. The word subtle here means crafty. And Jonadab would give Amnon some very bad advice. Now, it was still Amnon's fault that he did what he did. And it was his fault that he adhered to very bad advice. Verse number three through six talks about that, that Amnon was to make himself to be sick and then to take advantage of his sister. Amnon listened to that in verse 7 through 14, talks about the evil deed. And then verse 15 through 22 speaks that Amnon cast Tamar out. And she told Absalom everything about what had happened to her. Verse number 20, And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? Behold now thy peace, my sister, he is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he had forced 
his sister Tamar. So you find this whole drama, this whole terrible thing that happened in David's house. David really did nothing about it. It was his job to deal with it, but he refused. So several lessons within the passage that we just alluded to, 2 Samuel 13, verse 1 through 22. One, be careful who you fall in love with. Fall in love being in quotes. Be careful who you fall in love with. I mean, especially, well, men and women both. Many times love is not. Godly love, love equates to lust, and that's what we have here. Amnon didn't love Tamar. Amnon lusted after her, and he gave into that lust. And as what happens when that work of the flesh comes to fruition, terrible things came about. You see, lust is a work of the flesh. Godly love is a fruit of the Spirit. We can control who we do and do not love, and especially as far as marriage partners, especially we must love godly individuals. How many young men and women say, oh, I just love him, I just love her. When you ask why, it comes down to very base things. And the fact of the matter is, God tells Christians to marry Christians, not to marry unbelievers, and to do that by faith. We have to be careful lest our flesh take control of us and we become a victim of that lust, if you will. Now, I say victim, but we must be in control. If we fall to the lust of our flesh, that's our fault. That's our fault. I have things I regret in my life. Maybe you do too. Whenever we fall into our flesh, if we're saved especially, we'll look back and we'll regret. Amnon, it doesn't seem like was ever saved, so, and we never see his regret. But regardless, we have to learn to control our flesh. Be careful who you fall in love with. By the way, if we have that daily walk with Christ, we're in the Word, we know what He expects of us, we're yielded to His will for our life, then it won't be a problem. Oh, we'll be tempted, but we won't give in to it. Number two, be careful of who your friends are. Jonadab, yes, was family, and again, we have another family member causing great harm as you know by now probably that Korah was Moses and Aaron's cousin. Caused great harm, right? Great grief, no doubt. And we have this cousin, Jonadab. Jonadab's a liar. He's a subtle, crafty individual. And folks, we have to be careful who our friends are. I know I say that much, but the Bible says it much. And we must watch our associations. Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We have to watch who we're around. Watch who influences us. Watch who we listen to. Who influences your life the most? Is it godly individuals or ungodly? I'm not talking about people that wander around and say, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I go to church. Many of those people aren't saved. What comes forth out of their life that proves that they're saved? Why should you heed their counsel? Prove individuals. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, prove all things. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of being a discerning individual, being an individual that questions why. We had an incident where someone recently said, well, you should go and, and really look at my church. You should come to my church. And the first question we should ask is, why? What's a good church? 
Well, what makes it a good church? What makes it a good church? Oh, well, they have all these social programs. That doesn't make a church to be a good church. Well, they have energetic music. That doesn't make a church to be a good church. We have to be discerning and unapologetically discerning, guarding our own lives and the lives of our family at all costs. And it will cost, by the way. But the fact is this, we're either separated from the world to the Lord or we're separated from the Lord and to the world. And we see clearly what Amnon was. We see clearly what Amnon chose. We see what Korah chose. We see in the next lesson that we'll look at, in 3 John, what Diotrephes chose. We also see what Joseph chose, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and so many other godly individuals. Folks, it's our choice. It's our choice. Be careful who your friends are because who you are around, and I say again, and I hope you write this down, take it to heart, because it is true. I've seen it time and time and time again. Who you are around is eventually who you will become. Number three, be careful to live in truth and not lies. If you are saved, 1 John 2 and 4 both say that you love truth. If you're saved, the spirit within you gives a love for the truth. We prove our salvation by following after the truth of God's word. We prove our lost condition and at best our backslidden condition by avoiding living in the truth. Be careful to live in truth, not lies. Do you hate lying? God does. He is a God of all truth. Lying is one of the abominations put forth in Proverbs 12, 22. It's an abomination. It's an unseemly thing. It's a thing that he hates and disgusts him. He does not know how to lie. But, but there are people that struggle with lying. They would rather lie than tell the truth. They would rather live with a veil over their lives, lying to individuals, making things to seem to be one way when they're another. Many times, well, actually all the time, it's for pride's sake, so that they can look better, so they can look good, so people can perceive what is not true. But God says that's an abomination. It's an abomination. Bearing false witness, Exodus 20, 16. Lying on the stand, bearing false witness. Lying is one of the Ten Commandments that we're not to break. Thou shalt not bear false witness. We're to love truth. Truth is to be the foundation that we build our Christian lives upon because truth, John 17, 17, again, is God's Word, capital T-R-U-T-H. Be careful to live in truth, not lies. Love it above all else. Even if it hurts you to have to tell the truth, it's worth it because you're proving who your father is. The devil is the father of lies, right? Jesus himself said so. Number four, be careful to have propriety in our lives. Guard your lives. Take care of yourself communicate, be accountable, and you will not fall into the trouble like what we see here. Be accountable. But this world says, oh, I hate accountability. I just want to do what I want to do. I want to do what feels right. No one, no one should be able to tell me what to do. I should be answerable to no one. And so we have the mess that we have today. You have husbands and wives that don't communicate, and thus you have marriages that fall apart. You have parents that do not communicate with children, thus you have households that fall apart. You have churches that do not communicate with one another, thus you have churches that fall apart. And so it is. You see, if people have propriety in the Bible, certain individuals 
then their situations would have been better. You see Joseph, and Joseph was a godly man, but Joseph should have had better propriety. Genesis 39, 1 through 20, where he's alone in the house with Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife, even though Joseph did nothing wrong, Potiphar's wife's able to spin this tale about this slave and cause Joseph great grief. We need to have propriety. Husbands, wives, you need to know where each other are. Not guess, not hope so. When I hear a spouse say, oh, I don't know where they are, I cringe inside and you should do. Parents, you should know where your children are, what your children are doing, and children, you should be communicating with your parents, and you should be made to do these things. When a parent says, oh, I don't know what they're doing on the internet, or where they are today, or they're just out with their friends, well, what are they doing with their friends? Oh, I don't know. When that happens, I cringe, and you should do. It's a lack of propriety. If you don't know what your kids are doing online, you don't want, know what they're watching on TV, you don't know what movies they're partaking of or music they're listening to, then you and I, if I didn't do that, we would not be doing our jobs, period. Children need to be accountable. Their hearts are desperately wicked as much as ours are, and they need Guidance. We looked at Joseph, considered that Samson situation. If Samson would have been accountable to somebody, Judges 16, he would have, he would have been a, a better man, that's for sure, but he consorted with the women of the Philistines, with pagan women, and paid for it. Tamar's situation would have been avoided with propriety. Young girl going in to her half-brother, her half-brother saying, everybody leave. Well, that, that right there should be a, a warning, right? You know, a man and a woman that aren't married should not be alone together in a room. We see, again, with Joseph, the same thing. There has to be propriety. Those things lead to bad things. Now, all the time, bad things are not happening, but can certainly lead to it, and it does. I've heard about it so many times over the past several years. I've ex seen it from afar. I've even had it happen in churches where I've had to watch families disintegrate because they refuse to live up to God. They refuse to put the work in to live according to God's word. It seems like people today, they're just happy to watch their family fall apart as long as they can live in some sort of pleasure. Just selfishness, evil, wickedness. They're just not willing to take God's word seriously, put the work in. And be... be aware there will come a day of account for all that. I'll have it. My wife will have it. Yeah. So we need to take God's word seriously and guard ourselves and our testimonies. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27 encourages us along that line. Number five, be careful to control your emotions. Hatred and lust are passionate feelings. They can easily take over someone, but God has given us of his spirit so that he can control us and not our flesh. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. We looked at in previous times through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, or I at least alluded to it. It's amazing how Christ deals with the major things that tend to control our lives. You know, anger being the first one he really looked at Matthew chapter 5, he looked at money in chapter 6, he looked at dead religion in chapter 7, he looked at uh, revenge, he looked at lying, he looked at 
hating our enemies, things like that, all through the Sermon on the Mount. It's amazing how the Bible is what it says it is. How God does know what we struggle with. And we have to be careful. There's so many, so many emotional people that are given over to those emotions in our day. They refuse to allow God to have control. Amnon gave himself over to his lust for his sister. Absalom gave himself over to his hatred for his brother. And bitterness toward his own father. Allow God to control your life as I need to allow God to control mine. Or you can be sure that the flesh will control you. And we'll regret it. We'll regret it. Number six, be careful to play your role well. David knew, David got even mad, the Bible says, about hearing what Amnon did to Tamar. But <laughs> getting mad, getting mad apparently wasn't enough to incite him to action. Absalom even, the Bible says, gave his father two full years to act before acting on his own. Not that he was right to act on his own. But David had two years to deal with his son, and he refused to. He refused to. Be careful to play your role well. David was a man after God's own heart. David did love the Lord. But he failed, for the most part at least, he failed to instill his love for God into the hearts of his children. And that was his job as a father. And it's the job of the parents to teach the Bible to their children, to instill God's word into their children's lives. It's not the pastor's job. I only get to preach, teach Sundays and Wednesdays, whereas parents are in the home seven days out of the week, have influence over the children seven days out of the week. So there must be purposeful teaching. Again, taking it seriously. Because when parents do not te take the teaching of God's word to their children seriously, what do you think is going to result? Parents just going about doing what they want. Children just going about doing what they want. What do you think is going to result? Why, why are people surprised when their homes fall apart and their children are unsaved and out in the world living in the flesh? The, the parents have neglected their kids spiritually, if not other, in other areas, which generally is the case too. Deuteronomy 6 and verse number 5 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently, repeatedly, carefully, purposefully to thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way. Parents, where are you reading in your Bible right now? Where are you studying in the scriptures? Where are your children studying? Where are your children studying? If you say, well, I'm not and I don't know, then there's a grave, grave problem. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest. By the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Your home and mine should be founded upon God's word. Not some movie, not some video game, not some hobby, not some lust of the flesh. It should be founded upon God's word. And we should have those daily, nightly, whichever, devotions together as a family, not just our personal devotional lives, but together as a family. And the family should be a family unit, not a piece of a family here and there like so many houses are. The Bible continues and says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. 
We keep the scriptures on our minds. We study it so we memorize it as we do. We meditate upon it, considering what the scriptures have to say. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, verse 9 says, and on thy gates. Keep the scriptures before our eyes, in front of our, in front of our eyes and hearts. Be careful to play your role well. Again, I say there will be a day of account that comes for it amongst others. So we look at the context. Number two, we look at the choice. The choice. We always have a choice. We're responsible for our actions. It was a terrible thing that happened to Absalom's sister, but it does not justify his actions. There's no excuse for them. It's our choice to trust in God and his word and go our own way. And as such, it's our choice to trust in God's sovereignty over God-given authority. We have that choice. Revenge or faith. You can't have both. You can't have both. People seek revenge very easily in our day. They sue the government. They sue churches. They sue each other. It's sad. It's disgusting when believers do it. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was disgusted with the church at Corinth for doing just that. Ask them, how dare you? Why would you do such a thing? And the only answer is, well, the flesh. And that's the only answer here in 1 Samuel. We have a choice. What we do is our choice. There's no excuse. Oh, that's just how I'm built. That's just my personality. You don't understand the circumstances. There's no excuse. We choose. There is always a choice. Sometimes you have to choose the better of two bad options, but there's always a choice. Amnon did what he did. Absalom chose to hate him. Chose to hate him. Chose to hate his own father also. And so you see again in 2 Samuel 13 and verse number 22. Just that. 2 Samuel 13, verse number 22. Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad for Absalom. Hated Amnon because he had forced his sister. Hatred means enmity, hostility. He, he, he spoke neither good nor bad. He tried to be as neutral as possible. But in here, he hated him. He was biding his time. He was covering the hatred. It was eating away at him. Now, Jesus, as we've considered, I won't dwell on this, but Jesus commands us to love our enemies, to be kind to them. Amnon was neutral. He was not kind. Jesus commands us to love our enemies, not seek revenge against them. We looked at that in Matthew 5, Romans 12, which we've already quoted and alluded to, says the same thing, verse 19 through 21. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord of hosts. Christ commands us also to respect, obey, and submit to God-given authority instead of rebelling against it. If we're a people of faith, Truly, we're people that believe God's word, then we understand that whoever is in a place of authority, God put there, whether we like it or not. Proverbs 24, verse 21. The Bible says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Again, we have Matthew 5. Respect, obey, submit to authority. Romans 13, respect, obey, submit to authority. 1 Peter 2, respect, obey, submit to authority. Titus 3, 1 through 2, respect, obey, submit to authority. And yet there's still those rebellious people out there that would dare say, oh, God didn't mean that. But you have it time after time after time after time after time again in the Bible. So please tell me what God did mean 
And these people can't because it's just taken out of context. Christ commands us to respect, obey, submit to God-given authority, and to do so by faith. We have to humble ourselves. When you have people go out and sue, go out and march and protest and what have you, and it's just all done in the flesh. That's why politics in the church is such a wicked thing. It's all done in the flesh. And we ought to be living in the Spirit as we walk with Christ. It's not our job to right all the wrongs in the world. Do the wrongs in the world vex my soul? Yes, they do. They vex the soul of Christ too. They vex the soul of Paul. But it's not our job to right all the wrongs in the world. Now, all the wrongs in the world will be righted one day and that won't even be done by us. It'll be done by Christ. God is sovereign. He's in control. We need to trust him. Christ commands us to love our enemies, respect, obey, submit to authority. He also commands us to refuse to partake in hostilities instead of being a contentious person that loves to fight with others. We've covered this also. Refuse to partake in hostilities. Pastors are, are commanded to refuse to partake in hostilities. And the pastors are commanded to teach the church to refuse to partake in hostilities. To refuse to be contentious people. Our flesh wants to fight. It wants to fight that physical carnal war. But it's not for us to do that. See, Absalom and Tamar had terrible things happen to them. It was Absalom's choice to hate Amnon. Christ had terrible things happen to him, but it was his choice to forgive his tormentors. Stephen was stoned to death. Paul was abused greatly, and it was each one of their choices to forgive and not to hate, but Absalom chose to hate. Don't allow the circumstances to dictate your choices. God's in control of your circumstances, and you can love him or hate him for that all you want. It doesn't change the fact that he's good. So what's your choice? What's your choice? Will you let God control your life? Or will you just let the flesh? So Absalom's choice was to hold bitter hatred against Amnon. And his choice was also to kill Amnon. To kill Amnon instead of trusting in God to make things right. David was the king. He was the one that was to put out justice. And any other judge that David appointed... But Absalom chose to take justice into his own hands. And that's not, that's not God's way of doing things. We understand verse 23, 1 Samuel. Again, it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers and Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. He lived for two, two years, letting this hatred marinate. People do that. We call it holding a grudge. People do it. Letting the hatred marinate in his heart when God says, love your enemies, deal with your hatred, forgive. Now remember, forgiveness equates to mercy. It doesn't mean that we'll be reconciled necessarily. We should hope and seek for reconciliation. Matthew 18 says, go to the person and say, hey, you did me wrong. This is what I see as you doing me wrong. You were sinful against me. Now, and if that person will get right, then praise God for it. But if they won't, there's nothing you can do about it. But still, we're not to seek revenge. Absalom did. He held that grudge. Never forgave. And that grudge became a terrible thing. That led to Amnon's death. So he lived for two full years with hatred in his heart. And he laid a trap for his brother. He had this feast. It says in verse 24, Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shears. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. The king said to Absalom, Name my son, let us not all go now, lest we be chargeable unto thee. 
He pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? No doubt David had an idea that Absalom hated Amnon. But Absalom pressed him and that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. When I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you. Be courageous and be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him upon his mule and fled. So Absalom conspired to premeditate murder. Exodus 21, verse 12 through 14 says that's illegal, of course, according to God's law. Now, should Amnon have paid the price for his sin? Probably so. The law at the worst said he should have been killed. At best, he should have married Tamar, but probably the former. He likely should have been killed. Is that what happened? No, it still doesn't make what Absalom did right. Render not evil for evil. It's not okay to commit sin just because you were wronged. It's not okay. Should David have act and done what was right? Yes, but he did not. And God would deal with him for that. Should Absalom have taken matters into his own hands? No, absolutely not. Just because authority figures don't do their jobs doesn't mean it's our job to do what we think is right. It does not matter what a declaration says, what a constitution says. It does not matter. What matters is what God's word says. And God's word says, trust in God. He's the righteous judge. Trust in him. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, well, we live in a corrupt government. Governments have usually been corrupt over history. Ours is not unique. Neither is any other government over the world. We have to stop making excuses. We have to stop relying on the man-made constitution. We have to start relying on the divinely inspired Word of God. Philippians 2 and verse number 12, Paul writing in the midst of a corrupt empire. Empire now. Wherefore, my beloved, he says, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more my absence. Work out your own salvation. How? With great pride and strength? No, with fear and trembling. How weak are you? If you say, oh, I'm pretty strong, well then that's probably not a good thing. How weak are you? How much do you work to be humble, to be meek? If you're honest and you work at that, you would say it's not enough. Verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That means obeying authority also. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You see these people claim to be Christians, going out protesting, causing trouble. Those people aren't Christians. You say, oh, you dare say they're not saved? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying they're not Christians. They're not acting like Christ. They're not following the example of Christ. They're dragging his name through the mud. They're marring his good testimony. And that should sicken you as it sickens me. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. But could many churches have that testimony today? 
Could it be said of them that they have that testimony? No. No, 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 no. It's a blight. It's a blight on the name of the Lord. It says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You have no doubt that the nonsense that just happens in this country in the name of Jesus and how it grieves his heart. You imagine it will grieve the heart of Paul and grieve the apostles also. People say, oh, well, they, God's proud of me because I'm standing up for what's right. He never said stand up for what's right. God's proud of us when we obey his word, when we obey his commands. Just because authority doesn't do their job doesn't make our sin okay. No excuses. We see because of Absalom, he caused his family to suffer. Sin might feel good for a season. We talked about that with Halloween just on Wednesday. Oh, it's fun to dress up in the costume and it's fun to get the candy. Oh yeah, that's, it might feel good for a season, but it doesn't change that it's sinful. Sin always causes suffering in some way. Always causes suffering in some way. Hebrews 11, verse 24 through 25 talks about that. Hebrews 11 Verse 24, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Now, don't miss this at the end. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses could have enjoyed the pleasure of Egypt, but he did not. He did not. Sin might feel good for a season, but it always causes suffering. Always causes suffering. You have in verse 30 through 39 about Absalom, you have his brothers who had to, or they felt like they had to flee for their lives. Then you have David who thought his whole family was killed by Absalom and David had to grieve the loss of two sons, not one. David should have dealt with Amnon. And what Absalom did was not right. You see, because of inaction, because of David's sin and Absalom's sin, you see how suffering comes. What Absalom did severed any relationship he had with his father. And so we see lastly, for this lesson, Absalom conspired against his father. He held bitter hatred against Amnon. He chose to kill Amnon, and he conspired against his father. See, the bitterness didn't just stay with Absalom against Amnon, it flowed over, oh, well, my dad didn't do his job, so I'm going to be mad at him. I'm going to be bitter against him. How dare he not do his job? I would do a better job as the king. And so he, over the course of years, it was an undisclosed period of time, but over the course of years, he held a grudge against his father. You see in verse number one, of Second Samuel 15, Second Samuel 15 and verse number one. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early. You see, he's, he's promoting himself. And that's the flesh also. Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servants, one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. Oh, you're, you're coming for judgment. You're 
your purpose is good and right. And there's no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or calls might come unto me, I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. And so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He did this for an unknown period of time. An unknown period of time, but over time no less. The Bible says, verse number seven, it came to pass after 40 years, but people don't know where the 40 years really began. Was it there and David was a very old man or we, we don't know. It was a long time, it seems, that Absalom made himself to be famous, made himself to be loved, stole the hearts of Israel, all because he held a grudge against his father. He was bitter against him. We see this in homes. Parents play off each other. Oh, your dad won't let you do that. Oh, well, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, your mom won't let you do that. Oh, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Even siblings. Oh, mom and dad are so mean, aren't they? If I were in charge, then I'd let you do that. You have that in the workplaces. The supervisor won't let you do that. The boss won't let you do that. Well, if I were in charge, I, people do it with politics. Or if I were the president, if I were the senator, if I were the congressman, if I were the mayor, people do it in other places and authority in the church. Oh, if I were the pastor, we would, we would have different music. If I were the pastor, we would do this, that, or the other. If I were the pastor, people do that. They do that. They seek to suburn authority. They seek to take the hearts of people away and put it upon them just for pride's sake. And folks, the truth of the matter is this. Again, wherever we are in our lives, whatever God has given us, that's what God has given us to do with all our might for his glory. But we choose to step outside our God-given roles for pride's sake, to manipulate, to work behind the scenes, to elevate ourselves. The worst of things tend to happen. I've seen people who call themselves Christians do terrible things, and it's probably not over yet. It's probably not over yet. The best that you and I can do is determine to not be the people that are bitter against individuals and hold grudges against individuals and manipulate behind the scenes and lie to one another and try to put a veil over our lives to hide what's really going on. The best that we can do is determine to live in truth. Be thankful for what God has given us. Yeah, if, if people fail us, and by the way, people will, I'll fail you, you'll fail me, we'll fail our families, we'll fail in the workplace, the government will fail, people are human, they're sinners, they fail. But if we are failed, we have to determine to do what's right and trust in the Lord. To take the steps that God gives us in his word, doing what is right. For his glory by faith. Absalom refused to do that. He suffered because of it. His family suffered. His father suffered. We have to choose. What will you choose? Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would help us and that this lesson helped someone in some way where you would be pleased and glorified. Well, thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.